Hello, AP Psychers. Wanted to make a video for 9.1, which starts us off with our unit on social psychology. Social psychology, the way I like to define it, it is the interaction of the person with the group and the group with the person. It's the scientific study in the way that our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors of one person can influence the group. It can be real or it can be imagined, and how the group then goes about influencing the individual. We're going to talk about social cognition, which is my thinking about the group, and social influence, the group's influence on me. Social psychologists, super interesting field of study. They really are going to focus on the situation. One of my favorite social, social psychologists, uh, Phil Zimbardo, everyone's favorite social psychologist, uh, really talks about how the situation can put people in a position where they will do evil things. Uh, and he, we will study the Stanford prison experiment. Uh, so this is, we will look at uh, other examples of really interesting social psych experiments with uh, Stanley Milgram. And would, you know, what would you do if an authority figure told you to continue shocking another human being? Um, they really do study the, everything from home field advantage to the impact of, of racism, which is why I have put this unit first and foremost. Uh, motivation for being in parts of groups or gangs, uh, and how we understand and explain our own behavior and that of others. So attribution theory is where we're going to start with 9-1. We're going to try to apply it to motives, which really, if you think about it, is about 90% of the time that you spent with your friends is spent talking about why someone did something. We're going to try to articulate the impact that different self-concept categories have on our relationship with others. And then finally, we're going to anticipate this really cool thing called the self-fulfilling prophecy. So these are the terms, the ones that are starred or the ones that are in your Myers textbook, but all of them uh, should be ready for you to, uh, to use on an AP Psych exam. So attribution, what is attribution? Well, attribution theory uh, tries to explain why someone else did something, what caused them to do that. And usually there are three criteria that we use to judge someone else's behavior. We look at how distinctive it is. Is this how the person always treats me? Have they always said hi to me and now all of a sudden they're not? And that would kind of really get me concerned. Well, consistency, that's distinctive, oh, excuse me, distinctiveness is how is this person treats everyone or am I different? So they're saying hi to everyone, but all of a sudden they look at me and just give me the cold shoulder. So is their, is their treatment of me distinctive? Consistency is the fact that has the person always said hi to me and now they just aren't saying hi to me or have they just never said hi to me so I don't even notice them not saying hi? And consensus, here at Weymouth High School, we have about 2,000 students when we're live. Uh, we don't really always say hi to each other in the halls. We don't know each other. That's the consensus. It'd be like saying hi to everybody in New York City. We're not like Elf. Um, so if that's normal, that's fine. But if you do something against the consensus, we would start to talk about that. So if you ran down the connector of Weymouth High School saying hi to every single person, people would try to attribute why you were doing that. Backing it up, consistency. Someone would try to understand why you had changed your behavior. Um, and distinctive, if I said hello to every other student in the classroom, looked at you, and then moved on, you'd be like, he hates me. Why does he hate I don't hate you. I don't hate you at all. You're wonderful. So what is attribution theory? Attribution theory by Heider proposed that we can credit or blame or attribute the behavior to a person's internal stable enduring traits, or we can attribute to the situation. So I can look at someone doing something and I can say one of two things. Number one, that must be because of their personality. That's an internal attribution. It's about who they are. Or I can say that it has to be about the situation. That's the external attribution. So Jack eats an entire cake. I don't know why Jack would do this. He's a monster. It's terrible. Uh, do we explain that behavior by noting that Jack is greedy? I just called him a monster, right? That's an internal attribution. Or if I told you that Jack hadn't eaten in days, that's an external attribution. And you'd be like, well, yeah, of course he did. That makes sense. So we attribute, we explain people's behaviors by either saying it was 
because of something as to who they are, usually their personality or their intelligence, or was it external factors? Like he just hadn't eaten for days. That's, that's something in his environment, in the situation. Again, something we talk an awful lot about in social psychology. So let's try it. Julia is taking an AP psychology test and frequently glances at the test of the student next to her. Now, if I were to make an internal attribution, I would be, she is a cheat, she's a bad person, she doesn't have a moral compass, she needs cheaty to give her ethical lessons from the good place, all of these internal attributions. I don't know Julia at all, but yet I'm making all these assumptions. Brian volunteers five hours a week to help homeless children at a nearby shelter to learn to read. If I made an external attribution, I might think, well, what in his environment might have caused him to do that? Oh, he's part of a high school that has a, a, a community service requirement. So that's an external reason that's making him do it. So we have internal and external attribution. Jarrell recently moved to a new school and is having trouble making friends. When students pass him in the hall, he looks down and moves quickly to his class. Now, if we say internally, we would say he is, and if you thought shy, you are correct. Externally, well, situation, he's new, he's getting used to everything, and that newness is making him act this way. And probably the correct attribution might be somewhere in the middle. It's never perfect like that. So we do those two things to explain or attribute someone's behavior. Now, we don't always do it. Correct. In fact, we often do it wrong, and that's where this one comes into place, the fundamental attribution error. Here, it is the tendency for me, for the person that is attributing the behavior, when analyzing someone else, so go ahead and put yourself into the me here, it's the, it's the tendency for us when we attribute someone else's behavior to play up the internal and downplay the external. So the best one on this you're driving along, you get cut off. So now you have to attribute that person's behavior. I bet you call them all sorts of names, very few of which we can say right now. You make all these internal assumptions about who they are and what body part they look like and what their character is. But I bet you don't go, oh, wow, I bet they're really wait late for work and I, I better let them in. That's an external attribution. So the fundamental attribution error is when you look at someone else's behavior and make an internal attribution, even though you have way less information about the internal attribution, you make this error. So our definition of the fundamental attribution error is we attribute someone's behavior to internal causes their personality, their intelligence, their morality, their lack of all of those things instead of external causes like the situation. They're late for work. Their wife is giving birth. Who knows? You don't know. Make that assumption. Now, what happens when I explain my own behavior? Think about it. I reverse it. I reverse it. It's called the actor observer bias. It is the opposite of the fundamental attribution error. We attribute our behavior to external causes. So if I cut you off and I look back, I'm thinking, I was late. Sorry. I don't look back and go like, I'm a terrible person. I don't make internal attributions for myself. I make external attributions to forgive my behavior in that situation. It's the opposite. So when I apply it to someone else, I make the fundamental attribution error. You no longer have to make that. You can stop yourself. But when I apply it to myself, we oftentimes make the actor observer bias. We attribute the situation and not our own internal, even though we have way more information about our own internal actions. Self-serving bias is another problem that we have here. This is a type. This is a specific type. So I've just did the actor observer effect. Okay, underneath that umbrella in your head, go ahead and put self-serving bias right there. The self-serving bias is our tendency to attribute our, now we have to deal with successes or failures, specific thing. So actor observer effect is how we attribute all our behavior, self-serving bias, specifically about successes and biases, or successes and failures. Here, if I have a success, I'm going to attribute it to my own internal things. And if I have a failure, it's because of something on the outside. 
This is why, as an AP teacher, I am doomed. Because when you get a five on the AP exam, you will attribute your success to the most wonderfulness that is you and all of the hard work you did, which you should, which you should. And if you get a one, I am a horrible, terrible teacher. And so that's the self-serving bias. Now, what factors affect our attributions? Culture. So in our hyper-individualistic Western society, we are more likely to attribute behavior to someone's personal traits, their internal traits. People in Eastern Asian uh, collectivist cultures that are more about the group are much more sensitive to the power of the situation. So let's see if you can fill this in. Okay, summing this up. When we explain our own behavior, we are sensitive to how our behavior changes with the situation. That's the actor observer effect. When we explain someone else's behavior, we are much more concerned about their internal things. That's the fundamental attribution error. Now, what happens when I just think about myself? Okay, so this is different. This is now no longer thinking about others. This is now thinking about myself as a concept that's called self schema. It is very important in this class to know that schema is made up of three things that the definition it's a mental category. I oftentimes like to say that it's like Tupperware containers that are in your brain that we form from experience and we use to organize our world. So schemas, you have a schema of dog and computer and water bought water. You've got schemas of all these different things, these Tupperware containers that you put many different things. Uh, just look behind me. There's uh, one desk over here. And there's another kind of desk over there. You thought you're like that, probably like a table. There's another desk right back here, right? That's a student desk. My son's having remote learning. He's sitting at a different desk back here. They all look different, but they're all in our concept of, or our schema of desk. Helps us organize our world as formed from our experiences. Even though those desks back there don't look like desks, you still know that they're desks. Like this is much more of a desk, right? But schema allows us to be able to, to like go into a classroom and sit down at the desk because you have it in your schema. Now, self schemas are just how we view ourselves. So think about all the different thoughts you have about yourself and the different categories that you put yourself in, the different Tupperware containers that you put yourself in. Now, others put us in Tupperware containers, right? We try to classify people. Um, our society hates not to have someone classified into a gender binary. It confuses people and makes some people angry. Uh, so gender is one of those schemas. It's where you place yourself along a spectrum of socially constructed characteristics. There's not just two. Okay, that's, that's a binary. We don't do that. There's on a spectrum from what society calls male to female. Um, there's race and there's ethnicity. Just a note about race, race and ethnicity. Um, I, I, I liked this definition, and you should totally read this article from Live Science that I've hyperlinked on this slide. Uh, but, quote, race is understood by most people as a mixture of physical and behavioral and cultural attributes. Ethnicity recognizes differences between people, mostly on the basis of language and shared culture. Just please don't, don't forget that the idea of race was originated during the 18th century, as European anthropologists and philosophers explained a world dominated by the slave trade and colonialism. And it's from their bad science, their pseudoscience, that this false notion of a biological difference between races started which is absolutely false. The genetic difference between the races is not existent. Um, and classification uh, biologically based upon skin color really only shows uh, your descendants distance from the equator, which is, a, and it's, it's on a gradation on a spectrum. So it's, it's relatively biologically useless. It is important to know, however, that while race is a social construct uh, where we demarcate lines that are very fuzzy, without any genetic reality, it is still a very powerful force for both good, pride in one's group, which is fantastic. If you've never looked up the teachings of Steve Biko from South Africa, he is one of my favorite humans uh, to have taught in world history. But it can also be a uh, obviously uh, a force for evil uh, with systemic racism in our society. So race, race and ethnicity are also uh, ways that we can de define our self schema. And this list could go on. This list could go on, uh, and, and I'm sure you have many boxes that you put yourself into. I'm a photographer, I'm a teacher, I'm a nerd, um, and these are all self schemas that that I own. Um, so we'll have that list. But I want those three are kind of uh, primordial. 
So what errors do we make when we try to protect that self schema? Once I have that, that Tupperware container of myself and all the different groups that I fill into uh, formed, which typically forms around this time in your life with, uh, as Eric Erickson would, would tell us that you're dealing with in forming that identity. What errors do I make when I try to protect my identity? Well, the first one is just world hypothesis. So here is the tendency for people to believe that the world is just, and I think 2020 has taught us that, that is not the case. And the people therefore get what they deserve and deserve what they get. So here, assuming that bad things happen to bad people. So all I have to do to believe that bad things won't happen to me is just believe that I'm a good person, which I do. And then if I believe I'm a good person and I buy into the just world hypothesis, bad things won't happen to me. Um, this is a logical fallacy. Uh, bad things just happen, uh, regardless of who you are as a person. Um, and this just world hypothesis, even though it's false, it does protect my concept. I can look at someone who's homeless and I can go, oh, I bet they made bad decisions. I won't, I won't make those bad decisions. Therefore, I'll never end up homeless. Just world hypothesis causes me to not feel that stress when maybe sometimes I should. So someone who was homeless became uh, homeless because they made bad choices. Someone belongs in jail because he's an immoral person. No, people end up homeless for any number of reasons. Um, people end up in jail in our system an awful lot of times when they uh, maybe not necessarily uh, should be jailed. We have the highest incarceration rate in the entire world. How does the just world phenomenon lead to prejudice? The just world phenomenon reflects the common idea that good is rewarded and evil is punished. Therefore, if you have a lower station in life and being punished, you must be less than, you must be evil. It is easy then to assume that those who succeed must be the good ones and those who consistently suffer, maybe because of systemic racism, are the bad ones. This reasoning, for example, might enable the rich to see both their own wealth and the poor's misfortune as justly deserved. Slavery exists in the United States. Slaveholders perceive the slaves as lazy, ignorant, and irresponsible as having the very traits that justified enslaving them. So it really is bad thinking, which is going to be a theme when we talk about racism in this class. It's really bad thinking that leads to some of these assumptions. False consensus effect. Now, this is another error when I'm thinking about myself. Here, I overassume that others share our opinions. Um, this happens, this is one of the reasons why we have to carefully poll in, in political uh, um, uh, elections. This is why we have to stop ourselves when we're in a meeting to make sure that uh, we are not assuming that others are understanding us or are buying into the logic that we are using. So false consensus effect. Now. Do my thoughts about others and myself impact others? The answer is a big yes, a big yes. They actually change behavior. There's this thing called the self-fulfilling prophecy. It is a belief that leads to its own fulfillment. That's your book definition. That's not a really good definition here. Here, I have a belief about someone else. And that belief, because I give off characteristics that make them either live up or down to that belief, changes their behavior. So it forces the person to react in ways that seem to justify them. Um, so this is this one's important. It's caused by mirror image perceptions. If Juan believes that Maria is annoyed with him, he may snub her, causing her to act in a way that justifies his perception, causing her to be more snobby towards him. So what do attributions, why do they matter? Well, if we attribute poverty and homelessness to social circumstances, we can try to change them. If we attribute it to laziness, then it really uh, is like, okay, well, you take care of that on your own homeless person. So Congress is preparing to pass legislation providing federal taxpayer dollars to address to address the homeless situation. Money will go to build homeless shelters, mental and physical health care, and job training centers for the homeless. Now, if you hold an external attribution towards homeless, are you more likely to be in favor of, this, of the legislation? Well, if I hold an external attribution, I assume that it's because of the situation. So shelters, mental, physical health care, and job training are gonna help that situation, so I'm in favor of it. If I attribute it to internal factors, maybe the mental health care um, speaks to you, but the rest of that, like, well, if you're lazy and, and you know, bad things won't happen to me, so you, you must have done bad things, then you might not 
be in favor of helping out that situation. So, so this is where the beginnings of kind of that uh, callousness in our society can start if we have these wrong perceptions of attribution. Is violence due to personality? You know, should the 2015 slaughter of nine African Americans attending a church Bible study in Charleston be attributed to the shooter's disposition? Or should it be attributed to the situation of America's gun culture? And those are, those are things you're gonna have to grapple with, but this is where internal and external attributions really come in. So Marco nearly misses a car that slides through a red light, slow down, what a terrible driver, Marco says. Moments later, Marco himself slips through an intersection and yelps, wow, these roads are awful. So what did he just do? He made the fundamental attribution error and then the actor observer bias. So he attributed someone else's behavior to their internal characteristics, turned right around and attributed his behavior to external situations. Okay, my friends, that is 9-1, our intro. I hope these are helpful to you and I will see you for 9-2. Take care.